Hi, welcome back. It's good to be with you again. Today I wanted to ask you about contracts. How many contracts do you suppose it is you enter into in a lifetime? Contracts are used in business, contracts are used in government, and they're used in our personal lives. They provide structure. They tell us what's expected of us, what we can expect from others. Some examples I wanted to show you today are some of the largest contracts that I could find on the internet. This is Mike Trout of the California Angels. He signed a contract for $426.5 million. What gifts he must have, right? And Michael Jackson, despite being dead, signed a deal in 2010 for $164 million. Now being dead, it's not likely he's going to back out of that deal, right? And Patrick Mahomes, the star of the NFL right now, phenom football player, from Kansas City signed his deal for $503 million. Now, just to balance this out, I thought for fun, here is a chart of the highest teacher salary contracts by state. Again, these are the highest. These aren't the mean or average of what everybody gets. The highest. Gives us a little thought, something to think about for another day, right? But there was a day when a contract was considered binding. But now they're binding about as long as anybody feels like it, right? But as flawed as contracts have become, they still give us a sense of order. Without contracts, both explicit and implied, relationships can deteriorate quickly, especially for people who have sinful hearts. We need the structure and we need the expectations and obligations. God structures his relationships with us with a special kind of contract that he calls a covenant. They aren't the sort of contract that you and I can rewrite or back out of whenever we feel like it. Rather, God's covenants are binding on us. And interestingly enough, God makes them binding on him as well, even though he doesn't have to. Why does God continue these attempts at reconciliation with us? What is he hoping? will happen to these sinful hearts of ours. He is hopeful that each of us will start to develop a new heart, redeemed and restored. As you prepare for the message this morning, consider if your heart is ready to become a new heart, one that is devoted to God. Now during Lent, we're taking a good long look at the condition of our hearts because there are simply places in our hearts that are faithful and eager to please God, right? But there's also places in our hearts that remain sinful and selfish. And in order to be reconciled to God, we need to change the condition of these hearts. And God actively works to help us achieve this very important goal. Now, God has historically created ways to repair the relationship between his creation and himself. He allowed us the choice of obedience or sin. And when we have continually chosen sin, God immediately sets to work on damage control. He goes about doing the work in our lives to offer us opportunities to make amends and restore our hearts. Last week, we looked at the story of Noah and how God became so angry with creation. The hearts of everyone and earth had become evil all the time, and Noah was the best solution for to lead God's redemption. Now, God's solution was to great, the great flood, and, and again, he chose Noah to build the ark and to save the animals. But after the flood, God promised to never, ever bring destruction on the whole world again. This week, we're going to look at the covenant that God makes with Abraham. Why does God need to make yet another covenant with creation? And how is this different from the one that God made with Noah? And what can we learn about creating new hearts that honor God? Well, first we need to understand very distinctly that covenants are not merely contracts that can be kept or not kept. It is God and God alone who initiates covenants between him and creation. He sets the terms, he provides the blessings, and he also judges when we break the agreement. Now, whereas contracts are usually mutually beneficial to each party, we have nothing to offer God 
but our obedience. So we agree to the covenant through our response, the way we live. Now, covenant relationships are between a very, very powerful God and a very sinful creation. And last week, as we said, we looked at Noah and the covenant that God made with him. And it was the first covenant that was explicitly made between God and us. Prior to that, the covenant that God had made with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, these were implied covenants. God never spoke the words, really. But here in Genesis 9, 11, God spoke to Noah the agreement verbally to him. And he said, I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again would God do this. Now, the next covenant that God enters into is with Abraham, but while his name is still Abram, and that's important for our stories today. Once again, we see God initiating the covenant and setting the terms. But unlike the one-sided promise that happened with Noah, this time God asks for a response. God's relationship with Abram is detailed for us beginning in Genesis 12. Specifically, Genesis 12, 1 through 3, God makes some pretty big promises to Abram, who is not yet Abraham. I want to read those to you. I will make a great nation of you. I will bless you and make your name great, and you will be a blessing. And I will bless all the people that bless you, and I will curse all the people that curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. This begins what we know as the Abrahamic covenant, whereby God, through Abram, will create a new nation. And these will be God's chosen people, and they will be protected by God. And here again, Abram doesn't have to bear any obligation so far in this covenant. God is going to do everything through him. But it's when we get to Genesis 17, that God asks for an outward sign of a response, of an agreement to this covenant. I'm going to read this to you today from Genesis 17, 1 through 11. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you, and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. Then God said to Abraham, As for you, you must keep my covenant you and your descendants after you for generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between you and me. So this time God has set some terms for Abram, and God asked Abram to respond. And first, he says that he needs Abram to choose to walk faithfully and be blameless. Now, God says that Abram accepts these terms and lives by them. He'll be rewarded. Now, the reward is going to be that Abram will be the father of many, many nations. And now remember that he's 99 when he's hearing this, and he has zero children at this point. But to confirm this, God changes Abram's name to Abraham. And Abram meant exalted father. He was going to be a wonderful father, which was a joke to him because he hadn't in 99 years. But then he changes his name to Abraham, meaning the father of multitude. 
You're going to have a lot of descendants, Abraham. And this is really just blows his mind. Second, God says, show me a sign that you agree to this covenant. Because before now, God had not asked the thing of his creation. But now he asks for faithfulness and to be blameless and circumcision. We can't just sit back and be who we are now in our sinful state. We must do better, God says. Now, God's choices of Noah and Abraham are very intentional because they are both about as human as they come. They are both very faithful, but both very flawed. Even Abraham struggles with keeping this deal that he made. He's willing to follow God's directions. He's even willing to leave his homeland and everything familiar to him. But on the first sign of trouble, he has an issue. Just as Abraham demonstrates how faithful he's been, he slips up. In Genesis 12, after God has just promised him all these blessings, Abraham is then forced to go to Egypt because there's a famine in the land and they're starving. So they go to Egypt, and while there, he lies to the Egyptians about the identity of his wife, Sarah. Abraham is afraid they're going to find her so beautiful that they're going to kill him and keep Sarah for himself. So he hatches a plan where he tells Sarah, say you're my sister so that I'll be treated well for your sake and my life will be spared because of you. So rather than trusting God and where he's led him, he takes matters into his own hands here and he lies. And isn't that a lot like us too? We say we have faith. We say we believe God, use me, send me. But when push comes to shove, what do we do? We cry out, Lord, oh Lord, I believe, but help me, help me, help me in my doubt. How often do we take matters into our own hands, not willing to trust God? Now, I want to make a comment here about this word blameless that is used in the scriptures. Blameless is not to be confused with sinless, okay? God doesn't ask from us what we can't do, and he knows we can't be sinless. But he does ask that we be blameless. So what does that mean? It means living a life with integrity, being intentional about having a heart that is like God's. It's living a life that's dedicated to God and his ways and not our selfish ways. And it's working on our hearts to drag them away from the sin that they crave and towards a relationship with God and a new heart. Now, because we've read the book of the Bible, we know that Abraham's covenant was broken, wasn't it, by his descendants. And the subsequent covenants that God initiated all continued to be broken on our end. So God's final plan of reconciliation was, of course, to send his son to die for our sins. Now, believe it or not, the covenant with Abraham that was made thousands of years ago caused a real big ruckus in Rome in 56 AD. Some of the Jews there believed that the covenants that God had entered into were specific to Jews only as God's chosen nation. See, but what these people forgot was that God promised Abraham that he would father many nations, many, and that God's promise of blessings would be for all people, not just the Jews, being the most important aspect of the covenant, circumcision. Those of us who are circumcised are in the club, in the know, right? But Paul corrects this thinking by reminding them that faithful hearts are the sign of the covenant. Listen to Paul addressing these issues in Romans 4, 13 through 25, and I'll break it down for you because it's a lot, but listen to what he says and try to take it all in. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing, and the promise is worthless, because the law brings wrath, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, 
not only those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He's the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed. The God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were not written for him alone, but for also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. So as I said, I'm going to break this down for you a little bit. But first off, what Paul is saying is that Faith is not trying to obey and keep the law, right? Trying your best to live up to the law is not faith. That's works. That's deeds. But Paul also says that if the law is our standard, if that's what we're holding everybody accountable to, it nullifies faith. It makes grace irrelevant. Because no one can keep the law perfectly. And our failure to do so has brought us pain for ourselves, pain and heartbreak with others, and wrath. It makes us angry when we cannot live up to God's standards. So to make keeping the law a condition for the covenant makes faith irrelevant, and it makes grace canceled. Second, Paul continues that nobody, nobody can live up to God's standards. We're saved by grace through our faith. Every person, Paul says, in every nation, no matter where they live, are part of Abraham's family and therefore a part of Abraham's inheritance because Abraham is the father of all of us who believe. And finally, Paul talks about when there was nothing Abraham could do on his own to help God out. He trusted. Abraham was too old to have a baby and so was Sarah. Procreation would be completely up to God. And in that miracle, God instilled in Abraham a devotional faith that was righteous. He trusted. He believed. Now, it also gives us the example of what God expects for you and me. He doesn't want a faith that helps God out, right? We don't want a faith that is impulsive or rash. We want a faith that responds when God speaks, a faith that creates in us a new heart. Noah was the most faithful person on the earth at a time when everyone else was evil. Abraham was so faithful that he gave up everything to go where God sent him. And he waited over a hundred years to be the father of one child and even longer for the fulfillment of the promise of many nations. These guys had sinful hearts, just like us. They each had faith, but at time it wavered, and we're no different. We have faith, but it wavers. Too often we take matters into our own hands, assuming we can get better results, we can get faster results. We tell God we believe in him and his promises, but we get restless and we say, well, just to be sure, maybe I'll take over. In our reading from Genesis, remember that God said he was making an everlasting covenant with us. The word originally used for everlasting is better understood as open-ended. Okay, It goes on for perpetuity. It regenerates constantly. And what that means for us is that the covenants from God are not temporary, not something that happened once and they're over. They're not on a trial basis until we get our act together and get our hearts clean once again. The covenants are permanent. 
and they're regenerative in our regenerative in our lives as often as we need them to be. Because we too are a people who need covenants with God. Because we're just like Noah and Abraham and all the saints before us. We say we believe, we say we want to change, we say we want redemption, but then we waver, we backslide. We forget all the promises that God has made and kept to us. We forget all the ways that God has taken care of us and loved us. And we take control over the day-to-day -day happenings of our lives, as if God doesn't really know what he's doing. The covenants should inspire us to keep regenerating our hearts. These promises are forever, and so are the opportunities for us to change. Our history, our past, should be an inspiration for trusting in the promises of God. See what he's done in order to draw us back to him. And if nothing else, remember the death of his son, sent as the final means of grace for you and me. A renewal of our hearts is possible because of Jesus Christ. And all we have to do is meet him at his table, and he invites us there. And I invite you there now at this time to join with me as we approach the Lord's table again, searching and beseeching God for a new heart. Please join with me in the prayer of confession. O oh God, we confess that we are sinners in need of a Savior. We have broken your commandments and have each gone our own way. Forgive us and restore us according to your loving grace through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Know that because God did not give up after the covenants failed and he sent Christ, that you are forgiven once and for all. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And on that night that he gathered his disciples in the upper room, he took the bread. He lifted it before them and he broke it. And he said, remember this image. Remember the sign of this brokenness because it is about to be my body broken for you. Each time that you eat from this, do so in remembrance of my sacrifice and my love for you. Gracious and glorious God, we ask for your blessing upon the gift of our bread that as we take it, it would be a reminder of Christ's brokenness for our grace and our new hearts. Body of Christ broken for you. When the meal had concluded, Christ took the third cup, which is the cup of redemption, and he said, I now change this covenant. I now make a new covenant with you, that now my blood will be shed for the forgiveness of your sins, and that you will have your sins washed away through what I have done for you. Gracious God, we ask for your blessing on this cup, that as we take it, we would be mindful of the cost. And as we drink it, may we feel the release of our sin and the purging of our evilness and setting free to love in the grace and glory of Christ. Amen. Body, blood of Christ shed for you. This time I invite you to join with me in the prayer after communion. Let us pray. Gracious God, we've been redeemed by the body and blood of your only son. Your word promises us the forgiveness of sin and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit through our participation in the Lord's Supper. We offer our thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for tuning in again, and I hope we can see you in person soon. Um, but until then, take care and keep working on that new heart. We'll see you.